hope you enjoyed the first part of this program that brought you Bishop's Candlesticks, a one-act play encapsulating the conflict between good and evil. In this part of the program, we shall focus on a detailed analysis of the one-act play using Bishop's Candlestick as a model. Dramatist Norman N. C. Kenner has successfully adapted the novel Lemus Rabble to write Bishop's Candlesticks without changing the essence and the original spirit of the novel. You are a child. A one-act play deals with one single dominant dramatic situation. It cannot be elongated into a three-act or five-act play. So a playwright has to relate the entire story, event, or incident in one single act. Precision, economy of words, and action. Tight structure and pruning of extraneous superfluous details are the chief merits of a one-act play. Just as a swift takeoff and a sustained maintenance of speed are essential to win a short distance race. Similarly, the pacing and tempo of a one-act play has to be maintained from proscenium opening to curtain fall. I will begin by telling you the four major components of a one-act play. They are Everything happening on stage has a purpose in directing and contributing to the sense of continuity in the play. In drama, action refers to a single incident or the continuous happenings of stage. In other words, action it is that assists the movement of a play. Can you find any significance in these actions of Marie and Persson? They suggest that it is dinner time and that they await the arrival of someone for dinner. Action thus sets the time frame of the play. This action is a significant clue to the bishop's kind, generous and selfless acts of concern and care towards fellow human beings. Have you noticed why salt cellars are introduced here? It directs our attention to the fact that these salt cellars have been sold by Marie at the behest of the bishop. Here, action serves as exposition of what had happened in the past. A similar sequence we will show you. If you analyze the dialogues of the bishop in which he says, I had to pay it, you will notice the total changes. You are a child. I can't trust you out of my sight. The moment my back is done, you get that little monk's money to sell the, sell the salt cellars. Oh, yes. The salt cellars. It is a pity. Yes, I was so proud of them. They've been in our family for years. You? You are proud of them? Yes, it is a pity. They were beautiful. But still, one can eat salt out of China just as well. Or meat off the floor, I suppose. Oh, it's coming to that. And as for that old wretch, Mary Gringoire, I wonder she had the audacity to send her again. The last time I saw her, I gave her such a talking to it, ought to have had some effect. Uh, yes, and the bailiff, who is a very just man, wouldn't wait for the rent any longer. So you see, I, I had to pay it. So you had to pay it. Yes, and... Since I had no money, I had to sell the salt cellars. But still, I see I have grieved you. Oh, go on, go on. You're incorrigible. You sell the candlesticks next. Here, the significant value of dramatic action is inherent in the dialogue. The dialogue that brings together the past incident of the bishop paying the rent and the present incident of Person noticing the absence of the salt cellars. This is how dramatic action infuses continuity in a play that gives it its tight unity. All the actions direct us to the marked change of personality that occurs at the end of the play. The convict, who in the beginning had resisted the bishop's acts of graciousness and kindness, is changed into a humble, gentle being, ready to receive the Christian values of hope, faith, and charity. Sticks on the table and go. No, I will not. I will bishop command it. <laughs> he 
It is cruel to ask, but could you, uh, would you please bless me before I go? I think it would help me. to Paris. My good friend the gendarmes do not like lonely paths at night. That is curious. Oh. Thanks. Thanks, Monsieur. Thanks. I'm a fool. A child to cry. But somehow you will make me feel like as if something has come into me, as if I have become a man again, and I'm not a wild beast. The catalyst of this change is the bishop, who rises still higher in stature as he sinks on his knees in prayer. The bishop's candlesticks shall be the beacon light to the convict to steer him through loneliness and darkness. Conflict in drama is of two types, the inner conflict and the outer conflict. Bishop's Candlesticks presents both types of conflicts. That is why it is a successful stage play. Outer conflict is the struggle of the protagonist against another individual, a group, society, or impersonal forces outside of him. In this play, the outer conflict takes place between the bishop and the convict, between the two contrasting personalities. If you call out, you're a great man. But as you can see, I am reading. And why should I call out? Can I... Can I help you in any way? Oh, my nice king! No! Aren't you afraid of thieves? I feel sorry for them. I was a man then. I'm a beast now! They made me what I am. They churned me up like a wild animal. They lashed me like a hound. I fed on filth. I was covered with vermin. I slept on boards and I complained. They lashed me again and again. For ten years. Ten years. God. They took away my name. They took away my soul left me a devil in its place. But one day they were careless. One day they forgot to chain up their wild beast and he escaped. He was free. That was six weeks ago. I was free. To starve. To, to starve? Yes, to starve. They feed you in hell and when you get out of it, you starve. They are hunting me everywhere. I had no name, no passport. So I stole again. I stole these clothes. I stole my food daily. I slept in the woods. I slept in the barns. I slept anywhere. I dare not go into the town to beg. I dare not ask for work. They made me what I am. They made me a thief. They made me a thief. God curse them. I curse them all. You have. Your bed is ready. Won't you lie down? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I will lie down. Look here. Why the devil are you so kind to me? Eh? What do you want of me, eh? I want you to have a good sleep, my son. I believe you wish to convert me. Yes, save my soul, don't you call it? Well, it's no use, see? I don't want any of your damn religion. And as for the church, bah, I hate the church. It is a pity because the church does not hate you. Ah, I don't believe you wish to convert me. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> no, no, Monsignor the Bishop. I do not want any of your faith, hope and charity. Anything you do for me, you 
do for the devil, understand? The convict has to persuade himself to walk off with the candlesticks in opposition to the acts of kindness extended to him by the bishop. They didn't think of my mother when they sent me to hell. He was kind to me. Oh, but what's the bishop for? I said to be kind to you. Cheer up, my hearty. You're getting soft. <laughs> God. Wouldn't my teammates laugh to see 15729 hesitating <laughs> about calling the plunder because he felt good? <laughs> good. That was good. 15729 getting soft. <laughs> no. No. I'll take these now and go. If I stay till morning, he'll beat at me and I'll get soft. But a little later, when the bishop secures his release and also gives him the candlesticks, we notice that the convict's inner conflict is over. He acknowledges the goodness of the bishop and says, I have given him those candlesticks. You told them that you had given me the candlesticks? Given me them? I could. Let us watch a few characters to analyze characterization. The bishop is the touchstone of the three Christian values of hope, faith and charity. He acts as the catalyst to bring about a transformation in human nature. He cannot claim the role of the protagonist in the play, for he undergoes no marked change, as is the case with the convict. He is dramatically important for effecting the convict's transformation. In the whole play, the convict's role revolves around him, and we can see the dramatic rhythm in operation in the rise and release of tension centered through him. He experiences both the inner and the outer struggle, and the resolution of the play rests on the metamorphosis effected on him by the bishop. Person is highly suspicious and trusts neither Mary nor the convict. She is peevish and unreasonable in her anger. Her harshness is without basis, in contrast to the aggressiveness of the convict who bears a justified grudge against a feminist society that has ill-treated him. Marie and Sergeant are the minor characters in the play. They represent society on two strata, Marie belonging to the lower rung and the Sergeant to the higher rung. They carry out the stage business and give a realistic substance to the play. Dear Rights use the dialogue as a key to open a situation or a story. If there are no words, it is a mime. And if there is no action, there can be no drama. So, dialogues and action have to come together to carry a play from the beginning to the end. Dialogues, importantly, also reveal the character of the persons in a play. Take the character of person. She is arrogant to the point of absurdity. Yes, the silver ones. Are you deaf as well as stupid? Uh, yes, mother. Don't keep saying yes, madam, like a parrot in milk and boot. No, mother. Oh, it's coming to that. And as for that old, rich, murdering guan, I wonder she had the audacity to send her again. The last time I saw her, I gave her such a talking to it ought to have had some effect. But I don't believe that Mary's mother is so angry that you need to stay there on such a night as this. I believe those people pretend to be ill just to have the bishop call on them. They have no thought of the bishop. You told them that you had given me the candlesticks. Given me them? My God. You scoundrel! You pitiful scoundrel! You come here and I'll fail and warm with your feet? Steal from your bed after? You blackguard! Oh, Bresson, you are overwrought. Go to your room. What? And leave you willing to be cheated again? That's murdered? No, no, I will not! So far, I've explained to you about action, conflict, characterization, and dialogue. Recall what you have seen in the play. If we analyze all that we have seen, we see the structure of the one-act play emerging. The structure of the one-act play basically falls into this paradigm of Exposition, complication, climax, and demeaning. The bishop's kindly disposition, in contrast to Persson's unconcern and self-centeredness, fulfill the aspects of exposition. The 
the conflict between the human and the animal in the case of the convict is complicated by the sight of the silver candlesticks. To steal or not to steal, given the benevolent behavior of the bishop, is what provides the element of complication in the play. The real climax, however, comes in the bishop's effective handling of the sergeant when he says, he is your bishop's friend. Surely that is enough. What do we mean by dramatic? This term is not used colloquially to refer to a shocking or a sensational experience. In drama, it refers to a sea change that occurs at the end from what existed in the beginning. Now you can understand how important it is in a short one-act play, merely not over a half an hour duration, to be faithful to the chronological order so that the thread of continuity is not lost. The essential fact to be borne in mind is the difference between a play and any other literary form of writing, a novel, essay, short story, or poem. Unlike a book, a play is not meant to be read, but enacted. There is no provision for you as a member of the audience to go back to an earlier part of the play if your mind did not register it as it happened. In other words, a play is here and now, and its structure has to be so tight as to permit a smooth movement from the exposition to the demo. So strong and tight should the storyline be that the audience should follow the narrative without straining their minds.